Hi, everybody, and welcome to Trendlines, a podcast on global affairs brought to you by World Politics Review. I'm Judah Grunstein, WPR's Editor-in-Chief, and I'm joined by WPR Managing Editor, Freddie Decknatel. Hi, Freddie. Hey, Judah. We'll be talking about the Trump administration's long-anticipated Israel-Palestine peace plan, which was released this week after years of preparation and several delayed rollouts. Before we get started, just a quick reminder for everyone listening that the interview episode of the podcast went live Wednesday. Elliot spoke with Jeremy Yude about what China and the World Health Organization are getting right in their response to the Wuhan coronavirus and what they're getting wrong. Uh, Freddie, after years of anticipation, as I, as I mentioned, and not a small amount of uh, humor and mockery over those years uh, about this long-awaited peace plan, uh, it was officially rolled out this week with uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his principal uh, electoral challenger, Benny Gantz, uh, in, in attendance. And now that uh, all the suspense is said and done, it seems like we have a plan. The question really is, is this actually a peace plan? No, it's not. I wouldn't say. And I think it's a few things, um, but not a peace plan. Uh, on the one hand, it's it's more of an annexation plan than a peace plan. Um, it green lights uh, Israel fully annexing uh, all of its settlements in the West Bank and also uh, claiming sovereignty over the entire Jordan Valley. So the proposed Palestinian state uh, would not have any border with Jordan and would be completely, you know, the map would be completely pockmarked by Israeli settlements. Um, but I think in addition to to being that annexation plan, it also kind of has the unintended effect of being, if not more honest, then it sort of gives the game away about what the reality on the ground uh, in the West Bank in particular has looked like for the last few decades and um, just how much a two-state solution has become all but impossible um, since the signing of the Oslo Accords. Um, And I think that, you know, that's the unintentional consequence of this quote-unquote peace plan. But the map that they put out that's a conceptual map um, actually conforms very much to maps that um, both the U.S. State Department and Israeli human rights organizations and NGOs that uh, are most closely involved in in, in studying and, and knowing the West Bank have been, you know, p- publishing uh, for the last few decades, showing just the extent of Israeli control in the West Bank and how the growth of settlements um, since the signing of the Oslo Accords has basically precluded the, the you know the idea that there could be a contiguous Palestinian state on the West Bank, and so the Trump plan basically by giving Israel everything it wants. Um, really sort of shows that that is the reality. And I think that um, American officials, you know, going back to the Clinton administration, have pushed the idea of a two-state solution and a peace process that really flew in the face of the reality on the ground. And that was that Israel controls so much territory in the West Bank that you can't really have a Palestinian state unless you actually had, you know, land swaps and unless Israel evacuated all these settlements which the Israeli government, successive governments, made very clear that was never going to happen. And so there is actually this, um, unintentionally so, sort of honest um, portrayal of the situation on the ground. I think that's the, the it, it's something we've seen uh, a lot with Trump and his foreign policy uh, or his approach to uh, international relations, let's say, because I'm not sure that, that it, there really is a coherent logic to call it a policy. But there, it's this double-edged sword of it having this salutary effect of really reflecting reality and doing doing away with the pretense of lip service. Um, so with with NATO, for instance, uh, he just comes out r- right out and says to European allies what uh, you know successive U.S. Ad- presidential administrations have have said more diplomatically, and he says it more forcefully. Um, in this case, as you said, with with regard to Israel Palestine, he does away with this pretense that the U.S. is a neutral arbiter, uh, even if past administrations have done their best to uh, to try to maintain a, at least the pretense of a level playing field. And again, it does do away with uh, the viability of the two-state solution, which 
I think most serious observers have either play, put described as being on life support or already already dead in any case. Um, I think the other edge of the sword, though, is that uh, he, once he starts by reflecting or, or expressing a more realistic uh, description of the problem, he, he then doesn't go on to use U.S. power and to use whatever role he might play to move things forward. And I think with regard to this plan in particular, um, it, it, the, the, my immediate reaction when I, when I read the, the details of it is that it lacks empathy and it lacks imagination. Uh, it lacks empathy because it just simply ignores uh, Palestinians' sense of dignity and their right to self-determination. It just writes that entirely out of the picture and uh, and just says this is how things are now so we'll we'll just lock that in um and i think that that's particularly jarring when you see how much of trump's uh, appeal in terms of his domestic base uh has so much to do with these questions of dignity and self-determination america first uh and this idea that america has been humiliated by uh, all these all these other countries around the world, and so to to have that kind of rhetoric and and mobilizing rhetoric at home, and just completely ignore the way in which those very same aspirations motivate and mobilize Palestinians in in this generation generational conflict, this this decades long and generations long conflict, uh, just lacks empathy entirely. And and this idea that uh, that you could just buy the Palestinians out with with uh, forty billion dollars of investment um, ig- ignores all the very same appeals that Trump makes to his domestic base. Um, and then I guess it, it lacks imagination because it just simply s- describes the present pretty accurately and then just stops there. And it just accepts that as the best uh, outcome that can be achieved uh, rather than the idea that the U.S. role here is to, to move toward a more just outcome and resolution. It strikes me very much as a, a real estate deal. Uh, and it's unsurprising because uh, Jared Kushner uh, and Trump are are are, are organizing it, uh, but you know, in in real estate, uh, possession is nine tenths of the law, and that's that seems to be the, the the guiding logic of this deal. And then the idea being that you just buy out the other side in terms of uh, uh, whatever uh, whatever damages they've suffered. And I don't think that's a, a as realistic as the reading is of the current situation. That's that's an unrealistic reading of how these conflicts play out on a human level. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, the lack of empathy isn't surprising. Um, First, because there were no Palestinians consulted at all in this uh, uh, drafting of this proposal. Um, And that was obviously on stark display in the White House, um, where Trump was unveiling it alongside Netanyahu. Um, And then, you know, just a collection of uh, members of his of his administration and also very right wing supporters of Israel in Washington. Um, there was sort of hollering um, at various lines that Trump um, said about you know moving the embassy to Jerusalem and, and and other issues. But then also I think you know this is this is a sort of concocted real estate vision. Um, it's no accident that Jared Kushner is the point person on it. Uh, someone whose connections to Israel, um, you know, before the Trump presidency, it was well known that um, Jared Kushner, through his family, um, they're close to uh, Israeli settlement community. Um, it's a very conservative in the U.S. context, but also extremely right-wing in the Israeli context. The Israeli, the, the U.S. ambassador to Israel um, that uh, Trump appointed is also very close to the settlement uh, movement in Israel. So you have, I mean, the U.S. has, has, if it hasn't ever been an honest broker, um, it, again, gave away all pretense that there was any sense of balance. And and the Trump administration has been more in line with the hard right in Israel um, than any administration before it. And I think that um, in terms of this sort of lack of understanding of, of what, you know, national aspirations mean or what the Palestinian national movement is is all about and and the, you know the grievances that have been fueling this for so long is yeah it, it isn't about you know can we build a resort on the dead sea which is one of the things that's buried in this proposal um 
or you know having a shared tourism zone uh, in some you know stretch of land on the outskirts of Jerusalem or outside Ramallah or something. Um, I mean, I think what came across to me in, in skimming through it was just how little awareness it actually has uh, for the reality on the ground. Um, I mean, I said that unintentionally it, it ends up reflecting um, you know the just the map in terms of how much. Uh, growth and settlement uh, activity, you know, what that actually looks like on the ground today. But it has very little interest or empathy or knowledge at all of, of uh, the Palestinian situation. Um, and it really just repeats a lot of familiar uh, right-wing talking points and proposals, both among uh, the Israeli right and among the American right. And it's this kind of thing that, that a conservative columnist could have probably written um, in a quick draft. And then, you know, the Trump administration is trying to sell it like it's something new, but it's the idea of annexing the West Bank is something that has been, uh, you know, a dream among right-wing Israelis for uh, for decades, really. Um, and a lot of this plan has much more to do with um, Israeli goals that predate Oslo in terms of just asserting their control um, over the entire territory. And I think that in a lot of ways, you know, it, it, it this you know, proposal such as it is, you know, is the logical conclusion of um, continued support for Israeli settlement expansion, but also um, the lack of Palestinian leadership and, you know, Palestinian ability to um, really sort of push back against all of these trends. I think it, in a lot of ways, you know, it it's a sign of, of where things stand. Israel has essentially won and the Palestinians have lost. It's also, you know, really an electoral gift to Netanyahu, who's facing elections uh, uh, coming up the after two rounds of inconclusive elections, um, because it, it, as you said, it, it's it's basically written right out of the the settlement movement's playbook, um, and uh, and so it shows it gives him the opportunity that uh, to show that uh, that he can get what they want out of Washington. Um, at the same time, it also demonstrates really um, the the degree to which a lot of this stuff is has become consensus uh, in, if not among the Israeli population, at least in, in the Israeli political class, because Benny Gantz is uh, embracing the plan as well, and he's talked about uh, annexing the the Jordan Valley as well. So it shows the the the, the degree to which. Uh, this plan is satisfactory to a broad swath of uh, the Israeli political class and political parties. Um, and if, for instance, there is a power-sharing uh, government between uh, Gantz's party and Likud, with or without Netanyahu, this will probably be the platform with regard to the West Bank and, and the Palestinian, the conflict with the Palestinians. Um, and and I think that it, that really does show the contrast between the Israeli side and the Palestinian side. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that they, they weren't involved in the negotiations, um, and that started, uh, I believe, with the uh, Jerusalem embassy move. Uh, but at, at a certain point, I mean, this plan really, uh, from the earliest uh, leaks about the plan, there was this head-scratching among observers thinking it can't really be as one-sided as these leaks are portraying it. And uh, and so the Palestinians uh, must have caught wind of some of this because at a certain point they said, this isn't something we're going to participate in. Uh, and whether uh, since then, whether with the Jerusalem embassy move uh, by Trump or uh, the cuts to funding for uh, for uh, UN agencies that uh, that serve as Palestinian refugees and 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 other moves, the 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 Palestinians have just been squeezed, silenced, ignored uh, for the last several years to the point where, uh, really, with with the exception of some rocket rocket exchanges between uh, Israel and and some groups on in in Gaza. You, you very rarely even see the Palestinian uh, cause or side pierce through. Um, and, and, and I think that also has to do with the, the changing context of the reg- regional geopolitics, uh, the degree to which the, the threat or the perceived threat from Iran and the conflict between the Saudis and the Saudi bloc and Iran uh, and the cooperation really tacit and, and more and more open between the Saudi bloc and Israel uh, to counter Iran 
uh, and at the very least, the the consensus among those the that that wide swath of the Middle East that Iran is the primary problem and challenge to face has made the Palestinian cause increasingly irrelevant. Basically, uh, not again on a human level. Uh, the human suffering in Gaza, for instance, is 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 tragic and extreme, and things in the West Bank aren't aren't uh, so great either. Uh, but be, between the the Trump administration's posture and approach, the regional geopolitics, and then you add the fact that the the Palestinians politically are so divided, whether between Fatah and Hamas, uh, divided geographically between the West Bank and Gaza, and then even within both of those uh, territories, uh, there there is a growing resentment of uh, Hamas's uh, repressive uh, uh, governance, and and as well, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, has increasingly become uh, repressive in the West Bank. And so I think that there's a lot of popular discontent with leadership uh, that's divided in any case. So all of those things seem like this perfect storm that just relegates the Palestinians to the background of this plan that is supposedly a plan for peace for them. Yeah, I mean, geopolitically in the region, I mean, the days of ha- of the Palestinians having a powerful um, backer abroad are long gone, um, and Israel knows that. Um, and you know, the the countries in the Arab world that have either you know military might or more importantly, you know, economic influence, they have no. Um, the Palestinians are far down the list of their priorities. Um, Gulf states like Saudi Arabia and the UAE are almost, uh, it seems, willing to go along with whatever proposal um, the Trump administration and uh, the Netanyahu government comes up with if it means that um, this can be quote-unquote solved. Um, I mean, I, I also the big question mark as well as part of this plan is that it's, uh, you know, all the things the Palestinians get are contingent on Israel uh, and Israel's security con- considerations, but also on these vague pledges of, of money from the Gulf, basically. Um, and so the idea that these wealthy Gulf countries will, in fact, want to, you know, invest 30 or 40 or $50 billion into this future Palestine is, you know, more of a hypothetical. Um, and and I think that, you know, just that situation changing, um, you know, it's certainly since Oslo, but also, you know, if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, you know, Egypt has no role. I mean, Egypt obviously has a peace treaty with Israel and so does Jordan, um, but there isn't any, you know, power in the Arab world anymore that has the position or influence um, that existed in the past that could pr- that could pressure Israel or that could at least give Israeli leadership the idea that they needed to negotiate and make concessions um they've done that already uh and they have emerged um essentially with everything they want and no need to really give to change the status quo and i think that's really what uh it comes down to is that there isn't any pressure on israel to negotiate or to compromise um if anything between uh, U.S. support that predates Trump um, for settlement expansion uh, and for, you know, just letting the peace process die on the vine, that there hasn't been any uh, cost for Israel to um, making a Palestinian state un- unviable and and also to, to leading up to this point. Um, and if anything, um, Israel's sort of been you know, there's just been continued support, even as Israel's position has gotten more and more hard line to the point now that, you know, a portion of the West Bank um, will will probably be voted on this weekend in the Israeli parliament to assert sovereignty over it. Um, and I think that, you know, annexation and full Israeli control is where it's headed. Um, and I think that uh, also, you know, the, the terms of the deal, if we can keep calling it a deal, uh, it just shows, you know, what it might not end up looking like, uh, what they're proposing. But, you know, some some variation of it actually looks more likely. The idea that you would have a land swap where Israel gets to annex all of its settlements and in exchange, there's, you know, some stretches of desert south of Gaza along the Egyptian border that uh, are given to a future Palestinian state. Uh, you know, those are the terms that Israel wants. And those are the terms, I think, frankly, that a lot of Arab countries would be happy 
um, to go along with just because they have other things to worry about and, and it would essentially sort of wash their hands of, of the Palestinian issue. Not that they've really cared about it for a long time, but uh, even, even worse still, uh, all of the, all of the aspects of the deal, uh, or the advantages from the deal that Israel gets, they're able to immediately claim like annexation and things like that. Uh, all of the proposed benefits that the Palestinians will eventually get, they have to earn, uh, through these uh, vague criteria, but also things like uh, in for, like it, it, establishing freedom of political expression and uh, Hamas being removed from power in Gaza, things like that, which uh, I don't think are bad goals. Uh, the question is how realistic they are in the current context. Um, and, and I guess for years, we've been hearing about how the Israeli position and especially the Likud position is just establish facts on the ground uh, by expanding settlements until eventually it's too complicated to undo them and then uh, essentially uh, impose that status quo as the final uh, accommodation of a peace plan. And, and, and here we are all these years later, and it, it ultimately seems to have turned out uh, into precisely that. Again, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty with regard to uh, is the political future of Netanyahu, uh, but also Trump's political future with regard to both impeachment and the 2020 election. So uh, th- this whole plan could just be uh, recycled paper within uh, within a year or so. Uh, but for now, um, it's very clearly the best case outcome uh, for 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 Israel. Um, for the Palestinians, obviously. Uh, there's this lack really of alternatives because as you said, uh, they don't have any, uh, regional backers anymore. Um, and, and just one last thought, uh, before we talk about the Palestinians options to give an idea of how dramatically, uh, things have changed just even in the last 10 years, um, as, as, as problematic as the U S position has always been with regard to, uh, being a, a neutral arbiter in this, in this dispute, uh, as recently as the beginning of the Obama administration, the first term, so say 2008, 2009, uh, there was talk about, uh, the U S unilaterally recognizing, uh, the, the Palestinian state, uh, not necessarily talk in serious circles in Washington, but the, it was a proposal that that people were floating in order to pressure the Israeli government to freeze and roll back uh, settlements and really seriously engage in negotiations. Uh, the, the the Palestinian Authority uh, was considered to be really building out uh, the capacity to function as a viable state. There were a, a, a numerous countries recognized Palestine in the United Nations as a, as an independent country uh, and as a legitimate state. And here we are uh, t- 10, 10 years later, um, and and that just seems fanciful fanciful at this point. Whether because of the the Palestinian Authority having been starved of funds, the 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 uh, the, the divisions in, in politically on the Palestinian side, and this this uh, status quo that's being imposed as a final accommodation. So I guess the question is, what alternatives do the Palestinians have? Uh, and and with the two state solution essentially at this point really out of reach, does that mean uh, a shift to advocating for a one-state solution and uh, and full civil rights for Palestinians in a, a federal Israel or Israel-Palestine, uh, a, a dissolution of the Palestinian Authority to force Israel to take responsibility for security and governance in the West Bank? Um, you could almost even see Hamas saying, okay, we'll step down too and you can take over Gaza. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, uh, the, the, the Palestinians really lack options, uh, but the things that they could do could really put Israel in a bind. They could, although I wonder, I mean, on the question of it's been brought up before about whether the Palestinian Authority would disband um, and, you know, basically force Israel to to take security control and and, and do all the things that the PA has been criticized um, as sort of doing as providing Israel cover for. But I think the flip side of that is that um, there's certainly a feeling that uh, at least among some uh, Palestinians that, you know, these are their institutions that they uh, f- 
you know, even if it was hemmed in and it was under all of the terms of Oslo and Israel still retained control over large parts of the West Bank, these were still Palestinian national national institutions or, you know, proto-national institutions that, that they were building up. And so I think there is a sense of uh, pride and even sovereignty over those. So, that, so I think that will come into play um, as Abbas and, and the rest of the Palestinian leadership tries to decide what to do and, and how they can put pressure on Israel uh, in response to this. And I think that, you know, the, the, other part of of the sort of reality unintentional unintentionally that this um, Trump pr- proposal gets at is that even if it were to lead to a Palestinian state, I mean, we can let's just say it, it for now. Obviously, it's not going to. But what it does is it shows the reality on the ground again, where you know Israel is in control of majority of the territory, but the Palestinian population um, is increasingly, you know, the larger population uh, vis-a-vis, you know, Israeli Jews, so that you're creating a situation on the ground where you have a government that is, you know, controls a larger population, but they that larger population doesn't have full rights, uh, political rights uh, and other rights. And I think that, you know, the term apartheid that, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter used in a book, I, I can't remember if it was a decade ago or more. And that, again, is a reminder of what you're saying about just how things have shifted, that when Jimmy Carter used that title, I think, Peace Not Apartheid, in a book about Israel and Palestine, it was seen sort of as a lightning bolt. There's a former U.S. president using that term, and he got a lot of pushback. We also got a lot of praise from other people who said that this was, you know, a a fair uh, description of, if not where things are now, where things will be headed. Um, And I think that, you know, it wasn't an accident either that the map that they released um, of this proposed future Palestine um, looked a lot like there were comparisons to maps of South Africa uh, in under apartheid and Bantu stands, um, and that's a term that also that you know Israeli human rights organizations, Palestinian NGOs have been using for years to describe the reality on the West Bank. And so I think that um, as much as Israel you know has the power and is in control, they are there is still this looming question that's only going to get more and more pressing about what do you do when you are in control of an entire population that doesn't have equal rights. And I think that um, just going off of you know history, uh, that is not sustainable. Um, and it will force Israel uh, it, it, in some way or another to respond. And we, who knows what uh, that will be, but I just don't think it's a sustainable solution. And one final thought before we move on. Uh, the hallmark of most successful negotiations is that neither side leaves the table fully satisfied uh, and has some sort of uh, un, unsatisfied demands that, that, that were left on the table, but they leave with more of what they wanted than what they what they didn't get. I don't think that in any uh, objective uh, judgment or analysis of this agreement, that's remotely true. Uh, the Israeli side, uh, in particular, the, 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 the most right-wing uh, spectrum, part of the Israeli political spectrum gets everything it wanted, uh, and the Palestinian side gets absolutely nothing. So uh, even even in terms of uh, just uh, uh, objective readings of, of successful negotiations, this doesn't resemble one uh, as, as far as I can tell. So uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, but uh, uh, in a lot of ways, there's there's no more reason for optimism now than there was a week ago. All right. Uh, time to mention uh, some WPR articles for everyone listening. Freddie, which one did you want to flag? Um, I was going to flag Anupav Gupta's latest uh, briefing on India uh, and why less than a year after winning a landslide re-election, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, suddenly finds his global le- reputation stained. Anupav looks at the growing backlash uh, in India, but also um, beyond India, especially with its neighbors over this new Citizenship Amendment Act um, and other steps that Modi's government has taken that have largely been seen as marginalizing India's uh, 200 million uh, Muslim citizens. And I'll mention a great briefing by Imadadeen Badi on Libya's civil war. Fighting there has sparked back up after a brief ceasefire, largely due to interference in the conflict by many of the outside powers ostensibly seeking to end the civil war. Russia and Turkey are playing central roles, but so is France and the United Arab Emirates. It's a complicated situation, both in terms of the fighting on the ground and the diplomatic efforts to stop it. 
but Imadadine does a great job of explaining it all and concludes, quote, it is difficult to imagine this conflict being constructively resolved by states whose interests may be at odds with those of the Libyan population. Against this backdrop, and to the detriment of Libyans themselves, Libya's raging civil war shows no real sign of subsiding. All right, uh, two things I want to mention before we get to the Who Said That segment. First, if you'd like to stay up to date on everything we cover at WPR, go ahead and sign up for our daily newsletter at wpr.pub slash trendlines. In addition to free access to selected articles and a rundown of everything else we've published, you'll also get a promotional code for a 25% discount if you decide you'd like to take the next step and subscribe to WPR. Again, the URL is wpr.pub slash trendlines. And second, if you'd like to drop us a line with questions or comments, you can email us at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. All right, Freddie, time for Who Said That? What do you got for me? All right. Um, you probably won't get the person directly who said that, So, who said this. So um, either the uh, country in question or the subject in question. Here it is. That's a big no. We are a thriving community and we need to grow. To ask us to not be alive, even for a short period and certainly for four years, we cannot accept that. Oh, I should know this, uh, but I can't put my finger on it. This was a uh, Israeli settler uh, in a, who lives in a community north of Jerusalem, in a settlement north of Jerusalem, uh, quoted in the Washington Post, saying why they would reject uh, the Trump plan because uh, apparently the price being a four-year freeze on building new settlements um, to allow for this proposed Palestinian state to form, uh, to be established. So even uh, the hard right settlement community doesn't accept that. Right. I guess uh, I guess I was uh, mistaken. They didn't get everything they wanted, but close to everything. All right. Here's mine. Uh, again, you probably won't get the speaker, but uh, maybe the context of uh, what they're talking about. Please sit down and take your seats. Put your flags away and take them with you. I don't know. Put put it your put. I don't know. Putting the flags away, but then taking them with them. I'm not. I don't know. It's it's Myreed McGinnis who was the presiding speaker of the European Parliament. Uh, she was rebuking Nigel Farage's Brexit Party delegation for waving union jacks after the vote on Wednesday that formally ratified the transitional withdrawal agreement for Brexit, which takes effect Friday, January 31st. All right, Freddie. Great stuff. Thanks. Thanks, you, Dan. If you'd like to stay up to date on everything we cover at WPR, go ahead and sign up for our daily newsletter at wpr.pub slash trendlines. In addition to free access to selected WPR articles all week long, you'll also get a promotional code for a 25% discount on a WPR subscription. And if you'd like to send comments or questions, email us at podcast at worldpoliticsreview.com. Trendlines is produced and edited by Peter Dury. You can follow him and World Politics Review on Twitter, and you can find links to pieces covering the issues we talked about in the show notes on worldpoliticsreview.com. Have a great weekend, and see you next week for two new episodes of Trendlines. Trendlines.